Okay. <clears throat> Please take your Bibles and open to Romans <clears throat> chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Our scripture text today is going to be from verses 11 down to 15. Now I know we looked at verse 11 last week, but we're just going to, it also is part of this. In fact, 11 is where the paragraph uh, break is. So 11 to 15 go together, but it also concludes the part before it. So that's why we looked at it last week. Last week. So let's just uh, follow along as I, as I read it to you. Verse 11. <clears throat> I seem to have something in my throat. So I ask, did they, that is the Jews, stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make them Israel jealous. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm a really I'm really terrible at computer games. My boys can tell you this for sure. Uh, even the original Mario thing that came out, I couldn't get anywhere with it. I can't seem to get past um, the first little line uh, without being killed off. And and uh, and I think the one of the reason is is because they got too many enemies built into those games that just are designed to trip me up all the time. Now, in Super Mario, <clears throat> in uh, Super Mario, there are enemies that are called dry bones. Okay, how many know about these enemies? Okay, so I, I thought so. Okay, dry bones. And um, <clears throat> uh, they go back and forth on the screen, apparently. I never got to where they are, so I, I don't really know how they work, but... I'm told they just go back and forth, constantly getting in your way to keep you from navigating to get to the boss. How, how many of you have ever played Minecraft? Okay. Oh yeah, I knew Ginger was <laughs> going to be up there. Okay. Well, in Minecraft, there's skeletons as well, and uh, and and they chase you around and they shoot arrows at you, apparently. Um, but in real life, dry bones aren't going anywhere by themselves. They have no muscles, they have no brain, they have no heart, so they can't do anything. Unless, of course, uh, they are the neighborhood kids who are dressed up and walking around the neighborhood shouting trick or treat. Okay, then, then these bones seem to come alive. But the skeleton has no power on its own. It's just dead bones. And, and that's what makes our text in Romans 11 kind of remarkable today, because the the um, the Jews at the time of Paul are described in many ways by Paul as being dead. And verse 15 says, "Will their acceptance mean life from the dead?" We're going to see today how dead bones can come to life. Let's pray together. Spirit of God, we ask that you give us a spirit of understanding today. As we have prayed in the past, so we pray again that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our minds to comprehend your truth. Bless your word and may it encourage our hope, strengthen our faith, ignite our love, and produce the fruit of righteousness in our hearts. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> God tells us that everybody is born dead in their sins. We are just like dead skeleton bones that have no power or life. And, and left on our own, we have absolutely no power or ability to walk around and even to seek after God. Well, a lot of people seek after a God, but they can never turn to the God. 
in the context, uh, in Romans 1, 16, Paul says, the gospel is the power of God of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And when, <clears throat> when the gospel is preached and when the gospel is shared, God gives resurrection life and hope to dead bones. Isn't that great? We talked about that earlier when we were talking about the things we we're thankful for. In doing so, he has shown to us the word of his promise. His gospel is the source of life and the source of renewal. And in the context of Romans chapter 11, Paul has spent considerable time showing us the spiritual condition of the Jews in his day. The majority of the Jews in Paul's day were pretty bad. Uh, they were as dead as dead can be, spiritually speaking. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and God has hardened them in their unbelief. And Paul says in chapter 9, verse 3, that they are accursed and cut off from Christ. And in verse 22, Paul says that they are vessels of wrath, because God is going to pour out his wrath on this generation. They're condemned by God. And in chapter 9, verse 27, Paul quotes Isaiah saying, Who cries out concerning Israel, the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth and, and without fully and without delay. Their situation sounds desperate <clears throat> and without hope. And Jesus pronounced God's oracle of judgment in the form of seven woes in Matthew 23. God is done with Israel. His patience has run out, he says. The measure of the guilt of every generation of Israelites will come upon this generation. And God will destroy their city and their temple once again. So their situation is desperate. Now look at verse 11 of chapter 11. Paul says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Did they stumble over the stumbling stone, which he introduced in chapter 9, verse 32, in order that they might be completely destroyed? Who is the stumbling stone? Right. Jesus is the stumbling stone. Look at chapter 9, verse 32. They, that is the Jews, have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's Jerusalem, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him, so you see there, it's a person, will not be put to shame. And then in chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Whoever believes in him, Christ is righteousness to everyone who believes in him. So the stumbling stone is the Christ. The stumbling stone is Jesus. So this generation at the time of, of Jesus and Paul, they stumbled over Jesus. They rejected him as the Christ. Now, did they reject Jesus in order to fall permanently without hope of salvation? Is their hardening that God had done permanent? So these are the questions that, Paul, that are being asked. And Paul answers that in verse 11, by no means. By no means. So the reason they rejected Jesus, he continues in verse 11, was so that salvation would come to the Gentiles. We talked about this last week, so I'm not going to amplify that any further. So the gen the, because of their rejection of Christ and leading Christ to be crucified, the gospel has come to the Gentiles that they might be saved. And in the last part of verse 11, to provoke jealousy in them, that is, in the Jews. So are the Jews permanently without hope of salvation? No. Salvation's come to the Gentiles and then will be made available again to the Jews. So Paul introduced this concept of jealousy back in chapter 10, verse 19, where he quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21, which is all about the Song of Moses. So if you remember the book of Deuteronomy, they have come to the edge of the promised land. It's the second generation that, that was delivered out of Egypt. And Moses is talking to them. And in chapter 32, he, sings the, or he quotes the words of this song. And it's not a very nice song. 
In fact, I don't think the Jews would like to sing it at all. <clears throat> but in this song, it, he tells this generation that God, they will make God jealous by their idolatry. And God, in return, is going to make them jealous by giving the blessings and the promises that were theirs to a foreign nation. He's going to remove his covenant from them and give the covenant privileges to another nation. So it's not, so it's going to be the nations that are going to say, I am your God and you are my people. And what Paul is saying here is that Israel's sin is the starting point of a process that will lead back to blessing for Israel. Now we've got to remember that this metaphor of jealousy, this concept of jealousy is a metaphor. It, it's a picture uh, of, a, of, an, of an offended spouse in a marriage relationship who go, goes after another person outside of the marriage and giving that person all the privileges that belong to the offending spouse in order to make the offending spouse jealous and return to the offended spouse. Did you follow that? I hope you did, okay? And now, just to make sure that you didn't hear what I didn't say, God is not saying that that's how we fix our marriages. He's not giving the offended spouse permission to, uh, to retaliate by doing the same thing that the offending spouse did. It's not how we do it. Okay, it's a metaphor. It's a picture of a spiritual lesson. And the point is that when the gospel blessings and the covenant promises are given to the Gentiles because of their faith, the Jews will desire those blessings as well and will come to faith. They will realize that they've gone about it all wrong. That it wasn't in their law. It wasn't in the covenant that made them a nation. But it is through the stumbling stone that they stumbled over. So this is good news. Somehow in the future, God will remove the spirit of stupor that he says there in, in verse 8. This, he will remove the spirit of stupor from the Jews. He will open their eyes so that they can see. He will open their ears that they can hear the gospel report that is about Jesus. And they will believe. Now, not to be a, um, uh, a spoiler to the end of the story, and I guess I should announce spoiler alert here, but, but I want you to look at verse 25. Because we'll come back to this. Now, we're, we're not going to... I'm not going to, I want you to see here what it says here about this hope. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, talking about the Gentiles, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, there are a lot, there's a lot here that needs to, to be interpreted, uh, and, and we're going to look at that in the future, but I want you to see the hope for Israel. It is a partial hardening, which means that it's not forever. And there's a, a time thing there, until. So you're going to be hardened until something happens. It, and this corresponds with verse 11, which asks, did they stumble in order that they may fall? Permanently is the idea there. By no means, Paul says, because it is a partial hardening. It's not permanent. And the result is that when the hardening is lifted, the Jews will begin to understand the gospel and will be saved. Now, when and how did the salvation come to the Gentiles? Because that's what verse 11 says. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> Paul, or, or Saul... At this time, he's traveling on the road to Damascus. We all know the story. He's traveling on the road to Damascus when suddenly he is stopped by a bright light and he hears the voice of Jesus and he is radically regenerated. Okay, we call this the conversion of, of Saul. At verse 15, God sends Ananias to Saul to tell him that God has made him a missionary a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before whom? Before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, if you just flip over to chapter 13, verse 2, 
it says there that the leaders of the, of the Christians at Antioch were told by the Holy Spirit, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Okay, so, so it, this is a ministry, a mission that God has called Paul to do, to take the gospel to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and of course, when Paul is writing Romans chapter 11, he's writing this after the three missionary journeys have already been completed. And many Gentiles have come to faith in Christ. And so it can really be said at this point that salvation has come to the Gentiles. <clears throat> so verse 11 says, Through their trespass, that is the Jews' rejection of Jesus, that's their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now I've put it up on the screen here, and I want you to see the breakup of these Three phrases. The first phrase, their, through their trespass, has to do with the hardened Jews. Salvation has come to the Gentiles, so that's a description of the Gentiles. And to make Israel jealous, this is referring to the remnant Jews or the elect Jews. So now we can see clearly how verse 11 works out through the book of Acts. So let me just highlight it for you. So Paul goes into a town or a city. And what does he do first? What's the first thing that he does? He goes to the... Say it again? Synagogue. To the synagogue, yes. He goes to the synagogue <coughs> to preach the gospel to the Jews. He tells them that Jesus is the stumbling block that was prophesied. He tells them that Jesus was the suffering servant, that he was God's servant, and that he is the one to whom they must put their faith and trust. <clears throat> That Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Christ or the Messiah. And he would persuade some of them and they would believe. But then the leaders of the synagogue, what would they do? Yeah, they, they would get mad and upset. And they say they would say, that's, that's not the truth. That's not true. Jesus is not the Messiah. And they would persecute Paul and send him on his way. In other words, their stupor it was beginning to show. Okay? So then Paul, because of the trespass, would go to the Gentiles and tell them the gospel. Even though God called him to be a minister to the Gentiles, he always seemed to go to the Jews first. But they continued to reject Jesus as the Christ. So he would go to the Gentiles. This Gentile ministry is referred uh, to in verse 13 of our text. So just flip back there to Romans 11, verse 13. Now, what he says in verse 13, I want you to notice what he says about in verse 13 about this ministry to the Gentiles. He says, and I'm going to put this up on, on the, the chart, he says, it is much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry to the Gentiles, uh, uh, verse 14, in order to somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. So there we have the concept of jealousy again. But now it's clear then that jealousy is a reference to salvation. Through jealousy, through uh, in the, this metaphoric picture, it's not that they're really becoming jealous, uh, but uh, they are in fact turning to the gospel because they're seeing it in the lives in, of the Gentiles. And some are saved. So in verse 11, when he says to make Israel jealous, he's talking about bringing salvation to the Jews. And in verse 14, then, the, uh, the Jews, the, Paul's going to magnify his ministry to the Gentiles to somehow make the Jews jealous and thus save them. So verse, um, <clears throat> Paul is saying here that his ministry to the Gentiles will have a significant impact, uh, indirect impact, on the Jews. Now, verse 12 then is a recap of verse 11. So notice what he says about the Jews and the Gentiles in verse 12. So the first thing he says there is that the Jews trespass and the Jews failure. So these two words are parallel, um, trespass and failure, both referring to their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah and having him crucified. They 
Uh, <clears throat> they mean riches for the world and riches for the Gentiles. Okay, so because the Jews, uh, because the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, riches or <laughs> salvation, verse 11, if you look up, salvation has come to the Gentiles, <coughs> to the nations of the world. So then Paul says, excuse me, at the end of verse 12, if their failure means salvation, means riches or salvation for the nations of the world, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, this translation, the full inclusion, if I could be so bold as to put it, it's a terrible translation. <clears throat> I, the ESV editors, I don't know what they were thinking when they translated it this way. They, they moved away from their mandate to try to be as close to word for word. And, and uh, they've interpreted this word rather than translated it for us. And the interpretation is terrible. The, the noun here in the Greek is the, is the word pleroma. And it means fullness or fulfillment. It's the exact same word that is in verse 25. So just flip over to verse 25 and you'll see it there. Where both the ESV and the New American Standard translated it, fullness. So they got it right in verse 25. They just got it wrong in verse 12. The, the right choice, I think, in verse 12 should be the word fulfillment. So I'm going to change that here. And we'll make it their fulfillment. And that's the way the New American Standard Bible translates it. So how much will their fulfillment be? So what does Paul mean by this? What does he mean, the Jews' fulfillment? So if the Jewish failure means salvation for the Gentiles, how much more will the Jewish fulfillment be for the Jews? Uh, I think Paul is referring here to the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy for the Jews. In all of the, the passages that we've looked at in chapters 9, 10, and 11 so far, Paul has quoted from a number of Old Testament texts. He quoted from Hosea 1 and 2, uh, from Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 10, chapter 28, chapter 29, chapter 52, chapter 53. He, he quoted a lot from Isaiah. He quoted from Deuteronomy 29. He quoted from Psalm 69. And, and all of these, these Old Testament texts had something in common. They all basically said the same thing, that God was going to harden them in their hearts. He's going to harden them for their idolatry and for the rejection of the Messiah. And then he will destroy their city and their temple. But then he's going to save some. And he's going to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And the remnant will inherit God's righteousness. So it's a message of judgment, but then there's a message of hope. And Paul clarifies this for us in verse 15. And I think this helps us to understand this phrase. So look at verse 15. He says, for if their rejection, okay, so again, that parallels to the first phrases in verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> for if their rejection, this is either God's rejection of the uh, hardened Jews, or, or it's the hardened Jews' rejection of Jesus. It can be translated either way. Uh, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, so that's the same thing as the uh, riches for the world, or the riches for the Gentile, or verse 11, the salvation coming to the Gentiles. So by salvation, they're reconciled to God. So their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. <clears throat> For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Their acceptance, here again, is either God <coughs> accepting them or the Jews finally accepting Jesus as the Messiah. Now most commentaries um, think that it's God's rejection and God's acceptance. And, I, and I'm okay with that because I don't think that, that it makes a, a really big difference either way. Um, one of the reasons is because God rejected them for rejecting Jesus, and God's going to accept them when they accept Jesus as being the Messiah. So the fulfillment in verse 12 
is the acceptance of the Jews by God because the Jews have finally accepted Jesus as the Messiah. So whereas, just as the gospel had come to the Gentiles after they had rejected Christ, now the gospel is going to come to the, to the Jews and some of them will be saved as well. You see, verse 11 asks if there's any hope for the hardened Jews. And verses 12 to 15 says, yes, there is. It's not God's purpose to destroy the Jews completely, but to start a process that will take the gospel and salvation first to the Gentiles and then lead that back to blessing for the Jews. And look at what Paul says about these hardened Jews, these vessels of wrath as he has described them, about those Jews who rejected Jesus as their Messiah and had him crucified. For them to be accepted by God, how is it described in verse 15? It is what? The last phrase. It's life, life from the dead. See, God has plainly said that he has rejected the Jews, that he has hardened them, that he's going to pour out his wrath on them in Paul's day. The vast majority of the Jews in Paul's day are God's enemies. They're dead in their sins. And if God turns and accepts them, it is nothing short of resurrection from the dead. They are dead, and God will make them alive once again. So repeatedly through the prophets, this is the message that is given. God tells us of the destruction of Jerusalem, or the desolation of Jerusalem. We know that that happened in what year? 70 AD. Not 70, this one is 586. Oh, <laughs> Good effort there. Wrong John. one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is the first one. The, the, the prophets are talking about it happened in, in 586 when God through Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians burned down the temple and destroyed the city and took all of the people into exile. Okay, we also know from, from Jeremiah and even from Daniel that that would last for 70 years and then God would return them to Jerusalem where they would rebuild the temple and they would rebuild the city. But then God continued to say that, the ex, that their exile is not over after 70 years. It's going to continue to be under foreign domination. Remember our study of Daniel? There was first the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the, the Greeks, and then the Romans. It's going to continue under foreign domination for a lot longer than 70 years. And God's judgment is still upon them. Uh, but the end will come later. Jesus himself uh, describes... Uh, the fall of that temple in 70 A.D., John, okay, <clears throat> where God brings now the Romans, this time under Vespasian and Titus. Remember all this, we studied it in Daniel. They come to Jerusalem, they burn down the temple and, des and destroy the city. That's the process that he's talking about here. Now I want you to see something, to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 36, that we looked at in our scripture reading. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> I, I just want you to notice some timing issues here. So we're going to go through this fairly quickly, but I hope that you'll be able to see it. So God says here that he's going to take out their heart of stone and put in hearts of flesh, and, and, um, and it will be like dry bones, dry skeletons in a valley that comes back to life by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the summary of the two chapters. I want you to notice something here about the timing of when this happens. So in chapter 36, verse 16, we read, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land. So in other words, they don't live there anymore. So is this before or after the destruction of Jerusalem by the, by the Babylonians? Is after. Okay? So remember I told you chapters 1 to 32 are before, chapters 33 to 48 are after. So this being chapter 36, it's after. Okay? <clears throat> Ezekiel's reflecting back here and he tells them in verses 16 to 18 that God wiped them out at that time because of their wickedness and idolatry. So the first, first verses of Daniel tell us that. That it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed them, but it was God who destroyed them through Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, verse 19 of, of Ezekiel 36. I scattered them among the nations. Of course, so that's the exile. In verses 19 to 21, he says that God led them into exile 
because of their sin, because of their idolatry, and that brought shame to the name of God. So God's going to do something about it. If you remember Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, his whole prayer is, God, the city is laying in waste. It's in desolation. The temple has been destroyed. And that is bringing shame to your name. So for your name's sake, not for Israel's sake, but for your name's sake, can you do what you promised through the prophet Jeremiah and return us to the land? So that's what he's talking about here. So look at verse 33. Verse 23, God says, I will vindicate the holiness of my name. <clears throat> In verses 24 to 30, 11 times God says, I will do this or I will do that. Okay, It's God doing this, nobody else. Verse 24, I will take you from the nations and bring you into the land. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from your idols I will cleanse you. So God is promising to bring them back into the land of Jerusalem and he promises to cleanse them from all their sin. All right, now think about this. When Israel returned from Babylon... In 538, under the decree of Cyrus, which is prophesied in the book of Isaiah, and they then finished rebuilding the temple and dedicated it in 515, and they finished building the city walls of Jerusalem in 444, so they've been there now for quite a while. Had God cleansed them? Were they clean of their sin? Were they? No. No. So in 30 AD, jumping way ahead, when Jesus comes on the scene and he comes into Jerusalem, did he find the Jews cleansed by God? Were they clean? No. So th this promise of the cleansing of Israel did not occur when they returned to the land from Babylon. God did not sprinkle clean water on them at that point. Now look at verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So God says, Israel, you've got a, a dead, hard heart. And I'm going to give you a new one that is beating, that's alive, that is soft. A again, did that happen when they returned from Babylon? No. Now look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. So there's a cleansing, there's a new heart, and now God's putting His Spirit in them. Did that happen when they returned from Babylon? No. But when did God send His Spirit? When did He send His Spirit? Pentecost. At Pentecost. So here we have a prediction of the events that happened on the day of Pentecost, or as I prefer to refer to it, at the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover in which Jesus was crucified. Minor point, right, Curtis? So Ezekiel says that God's going to sprinkle them clean with clean water, that he's going to give them a new heart, and he's going to put his spirit upon them, all referring to the time of Pentecost. After the death of Christ and the resurrection, and even the ascension, and the Spirit comes. So here we have this prediction of the day of Pentecost and the coming of the new of the new covenant, because Ezekiel 36 is saying the same things that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, where he specifically calls it the new covenant. Everybody in the new covenant is going to know God. They're going to know Him intimately because they are all going to be spiritually saved. So Ezekiel says that God's going to sprinkle you with clean water. He's going to wash you and put his spirit in you. Now I want you to jump over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And then we're going to come back to Ezekiel 36. We're going to do this quickly. So in John chapter 3, <clears throat> Jesus now brings the text of Ezekiel, the message of Ezekiel 36, to his day. Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you experience new birth, unless new birth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's telling Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, you're, you're in a stupor, 
your eyes have been closed. And in Ezekiel, God says that he's going to take uh, out your heart of stone. Of course, what happens if you remove your heart? You die. <laughs> you die. Okay. Modern medicine is a sign because we apparently have machines we can hook up to you and keep you alive while you don't have your heart. But that can't happen for very long. You die. So if God removes your heart, you're dead. When he gives you a new heart, what happens? You come back to life, okay? which is the picture of resurrection. Uh, that's life from the dead. And, and so Nicodemus is confused and he asks Jesus, how can a man be born again when he is old? He can't enter his mother's womb again. That's just uh, absurd. Absurd? Absurd. absurd. What's the word? Okay, I'll buy that. What's Jesus' response there in John 3, 5? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so what's the water and the Spirit? Ezekiel 36. I will cleanse you with cleansing water, and I will put my Spirit within you. And so Nicodemus, he says... Nicodemus, here's what I mean by the new birth. You need to be cleansed with a new heart and by my spirit. In verse 10, Jesus rebukes Nicodemus and he says to him, you know, Nicodemus, you spent your whole life studying the scriptures and there it was right there in the book of Ezekiel and you didn't see it. Okay, now jump back to the book of Ezekiel 36, verse 28. Ezekiel 36, verse 28. We're almost done. <clears throat> verse 28 says you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God so that's the, the covenant formula again so it's a reference to that covenant when will they dwell in the land and be God's covenant people what does the context say when do they dwell in the land and become God's covenant people when the kingdom comes when the spirit comes gives you a new heart it cleanses you from your wickedness and from all of your idols that's when you become a covenant people and dwell in the land all of the context is at the time of Christ in verses 33 to 38 God will rebuild the cities and the land will be like what the garden of what do you say there it's going to be like the garden of Eden <coughs> The neat thing about the Garden of Eden is it was without sin in its original creation that it became sinful. And God has promised that in the end He will renew the Garden of Eden and it will be sinless again. So this is what He's talking about. It's a new creation. So it's not the plot of land, the plot of dirt in the Middle East He's talking about. But He's talking about, about uh, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Garden of Eden, the new creation that is happening. <coughs> That is going to be theirs. So notice the progression here. At first God rejects them, and then he accepts them, and he says, and it will be like life after death. So chapter 37 now being the valley of dry bones. We're not going to go through all those verses, but a couple. It's a description of life coming from the dead. Okay? It, is a, it, it is definitely a picture of regeneration, but specifically it is the regeneration of Israel after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Okay, look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath. And who's the breath? That's the Holy Spirit. I will cause breath, I'll cause the Spirit to enter you, and you shall live. What did 36 say? Say, you'll be washed with water, and the Spirit will come into you. It's resurrection. It's life from death. Verse 11. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. Okay, that's 11, chapter 11, 11 that we're looking at in our text. Is there any hope for them? They, did they stumble over the Christ to be permanently um, cut off? And it says, in, that, in fact, that's what it says. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. That's exactly how Paul describes them in chapter 9, verse 3. He said they were cut off from Christ. All right, come back to our text now in Romans chapter 11, 15. 
Romans chapter 11, verse 15. The Gentiles will be reconciled with God. They're going to receive the blessings and the riches of salvation. Things that we talked about this morning, we gave thanks to God for all of the riches that we have in Christ. And how much more, he says, will the Jews be blessed when they realized that they had the truth and they missed it and God judged them. But then God lifted the hardening so that they can believe. How much more? He's going to open their eyes, their ears. He's going to cleanse them from their sin and put His Spirit in them. And they too will be reconciled to God. God has not forgotten them. So if we continue on in chapter 11 from verses 16 to 24, Paul's going to illustrate for us the truth of the olive tree metaphor. So the cutting off of branches and the, and the grafting in of branches. We're going to look at those um, next time that we, we come together so that we can see how this illustrates this truth of the gospel going to the Gentiles and then the gospel coming to the Jewish people. So in conclusion, in conclusion, I've got four quick things to say. So what does this mean to us? What does all of this mean? I mean, it's, in a, it's dry teaching in one sense, isn't it? So first, I think it, it's certainly beginning to, it's the beginning of putting our eschatology timeline together, particularly for the Jews, and it's putting it into perspective for us. Okay, this chapter is not all in the future, as some want to teach. I think that this teaches us that if we take the time to study the scriptures thoroughly and with our presuppositions in check, okay, then we will find that truth will make itself known. And, and there's a great freedom that comes in knowing the truth. This is one of the reasons why I left dispensationalism. I, 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 I could spout off everything that all of the, they, they, they taught. I created the charts. I love the charts. That's what made it exciting. But I always had these questions in the back of my mind. And then one day I decided, I'm going to take my Bible and read the verses that they say prove these points. And I discovered, it's not what the Bible's saying at all. These, these teachers are wrong. I had a lot of these questions. And, and, and studying the scriptures and putting aside my own presuppositions, I discovered that the truth can be found. The Bible has now come alive like it has never been alive before. And the result of that is it increases my faith, my hope, and makes me a better worshiper of God. <clears throat> the second thing is this text teaches us, teaches us of the true lostness of people. <clears throat> it helps us to recognize that, that though people live, move, breathe, and exercise their wills, we are all ultimately, we all ultimately follow our sinful desires and, and we follow them to the end, which is death. <clears throat> Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 6 says, each of us has turned to his own way. We are, we are unable to live lives that are alive to God, lives that please him. Then God's word comes. We hear the gospel through a friend or, or a preacher, and, and Christ, uh, by His Spirit, says, Live! And, and suddenly our stone-cold hearts begin to thaw and beat in rhythm with, the, with God's decree. First we see the peril and the poison of our sin. Then the eyes of our, our hearts blink open, and, and we wake to the, to the beauty and to the reality of Jesus Christ. It's the resurrection of our souls that we call regeneration. It is life from death. <clears throat> We're in a desperate situation, and only resurrection can save us. And Christ has done that by being the first fruits of resurrection. Thirdly, I think that once this happens, the reality of what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins it begins to shake us in our boats. And we understand just what the grace of God really means. We begin to experience in transformation, or <clears throat> we begin to experience the transformation of becoming a true worshiper of God. 
Thanksgiving and gratitude are, the, are no longer reserved for one day of the year. But it's something we do all the time. Friends, acknowledge God's word in its fullness. It fills us out making us, uh, our knowledge of God's word in its fullness fills us out making us healthy, mature, and loving worshipers of God. And my last point, <coughs> and <coughs> which is good because I begin to lo lose the voice here. For the Jews in Paul's days, it appeared that there was no hope at all. They were so hard and so hardened against Jesus that it looked like none of them could be saved. But God is full of mercy and grace. He, he could, on the one hand, tell them how angry he was over their sin. And on the other hand, he could offer them hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter who it is that is hardened against Christ. And it doesn't matter how hard they are against him. No one is beyond saving if God offers his grace. And we need to keep that in mind. There's a day of judgment coming. And everyone will pay for their sin and rejection of God and of Jesus. But it tells us in the Bible, if you confess with your mouth, this is Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. I'm urging you today to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Let's pray. Father, in your grace, you have saved us through faith in Jesus Christ. You have given us life from death, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We pray for loved ones and friends who are still walking dead, that you will wash them clean from their sin and give them a new heart, and give them your spirit that they too may know life from death. And Father, we worship you. We worship you with such grateful and thankful hearts for all that you have done. For while we were dead, you sent Christ to die in our place that we might have life. Oh Lord, thank you so much. We bless your name, your holy and great and awesome name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.